I brought just bang, brought it in and said, okay, this is for sale. We're going to go, we're going to start with this. <laughs> Man, that's pretty good. All right. Welcome to the comics aficionados, everybody. It's going to be a little bit different show. It's what we're going to call a, an old school comics and chill. We're just here to talk about comics and stuff. I was recently on vacation, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to plan out. We didn't, I didn't have a time to time to prep or anything. So we're just going to talk old school comics. But before I will talk a little bit about my vacation. As some of you may know, I went and um, uh, Doug Ernst, another YouTuber. He's a friend of mine. He was visiting the Philippines on a mission trip and he was a couple of islands away. So I, Gathered the entire family up. We grabbed the two kids, my wife. We we took a ferry over and we got to hang out with Doug over the weekend. It was a lot of fun. Super cool dude. Exactly who you would expect him to be, you know, from his channel. Uh, got a nice dry sense of humor. I'm going to say that's Breen. It is. My phone sucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we got to we got to hang out and uh, <laughs> throws it we across to, the room. <laughs> We went to the went, went to a resort where they were hanging out. I took my son, uh, my son who's four years old there, and the baby, and we got to meet him. And and uh, they were he and and Doug were splashing each other in the pool. He's he was trying to uh, drown Doug with water, so that was a lot of fun. And then he gave him uh, what did Doug give? Gave him, Doug gave him this. He gave him a a Spider Man book because he knew he's a Spider Man fan, so that was really cool. Oh, that's cool. That's dope. Yep, and. Uh, Needless to say, my son was very enamored about Tito Doug, Tito being the word for uncle here in the Philippines, and we had a great time. And then, uh, what did he give me? I think it's right here. Do I have it? No, it's here. And then he uh, hand delivered me my copy of Soul Finder, and it That's is rad. Uh, uh, autographed by the three creators. So that was a lot of fun. We talked some comic books. We talked a little bit out of YouTube, life in general. Had a good time. And uh, he did a lot of good work on his mission trip, and they did a lot of good stuff. And I was very impressed with like their organization. And uh, I'm certain that he will talk about that on his channel, and maybe um, and some of the stuff that they did specifically. So I don't want to talk about all the all the great stuff. But then on the way back, the dads out there will know what I'm talking about. When you when you take a trip with your wife and your two kids, you are essentially the bag man. And then. Uh, <laughs> So I was carrying, you know, uh, enough stuff for four people on my own. While my wife was was carrying the the eight month old and then uh, dragging the four year old around. And then when he got too tired to walk, I was carrying all the bags and the four year old. <laughs> so my back is done. My feet are killing me. I got my what is it? Uh, my plantar fasciitis is definitely creeping in on me. And then uh, and the last day, so where we were with. With uh, Doug, it was, it was this place called Ilo Ilo. We were going to take a, a flight back to make a ferry from Cebu, which is one of the bigger cities here. So we woke up at 2 a.m. to get this ferry. We had to wake up at 2 a.m. for a 6.30 flight to get the ferry back. We get to the ferry. We find out it doesn't longer takes off at 2 p.m. It takes off at 11.30 p.m. So we woke up at 2 a.m. for nothing, and I had to to drag all of these bags and the kids all over town. And Cebu is celebrating their fiesta, which is called Cine Log. So there was an enormous party going on around us. <laughs> I was dead tired, but I was very happy to get home. We had a lot of fun. Doug's a great guy. And uh, we had a, yeah, we had he, a he seems He seems tremendous. He's very, very, he has a very, uh, very big heart. He's a very magnanimous person. Yeah. And he's just a uh, really like, down earth like normal guy kind of is what you'd expect you know when you sometimes when you, you see people on youtube or, or other uh like mediums and when you finally meet him they're, they're a little bit different doug's exactly who he puts out on the internet he's just a, like a, <laughs> a down earth guy that likes comic books and wants to talk politics sometimes <laughs> well that's that's good yeah as long as you know that person isn't like dead polar opposite of you and then then that can be painful i guess but so it's nice nice to meet him and, and find out there's there's nothing fake about him that's basically who he presents is who he is and that's my quick five minute story about my trip meeting Doug Ernst we had a great time that was my first trip with both of my kids and the wife so it was a it was a, a big undertaking for me and we had a lot of fun but we're here to talk about old school comics and who better to talk about old comics than 
the man. I think you were there when comics were invented, Breen, right? I obviously wasn't there when they invented cell phones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the other three people on the channel that we like to call the trifecta of disrespect. And we got Doc, <laughs> we got Pele, and we got Ash on comics. What's up, fellas? I love that name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I'm good with that. Yeah. Of course, that yeah. was stolen from uh, Green and I's uh, five times comic book slapped readers in the face. That's what he called the the three times they disrespected Spider Man. The trifecta of disrespect. It was a really fun video. What did you think about that, Breen? That was your first time doing one of those videos with me. Well, as long as it wasn't also the last, I said it was. I enjoyed it. I said I, I'm looking forward to doing more of those. Oh, we know it's not the last because we recorded another video already. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't realize that uh, Breen was an elder statesman like myself. That uh, well, I've, yeah, I've got more respect for him now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now he's got that much. Um, <laughs> no, so, yeah, when you were talking about it, when you when you said you had a hundred and one or hundred and two thousand, whatever, you know, I went silent because I know what I know what half of that takes up. I can only imagine what you know, twice of you know, what I had because that would be you, know, you I had. I only had half of what you have now, and I was always afraid that it was going to end up on the first floor. Yeah, if you know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> well, I, I planned the house. I planned the house around the comic collection. And, <laughs> okay, now that now I, now I have more respect for you. <laughs> I, uh, awesome. I, I I planned it out as as open storage in the basement with with silver, bronze, copper age in modern. And the and the different areas have the different you know have the different in the titles are or coordinated according to era, and uh, it's yeah it's 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 logical but it's it's still it's still a hell of a lot of comics. <laughs> I, I've I've got to I've got to ask, do you, do you have a hundred and two thousand different books or you know I mean does that include doubles or you know variant covers and whatnot? Yeah, that includes that includes variants. That includes you know uh, individual one hundred about almost one hundred and three thousand according to my according to my census, uh, almost one hundred and three thousand uh, individual comics, uh, not counting graphic novels. No, it's, but, but I mean, so you know, because I mean, I like I said I had like fifty five thousand, give or take a couple hundred at, at you know my apex, and I had. Every Marvel superhero book from FF1 through Fear itself, I had almost every DC superhero comic published from like 62 to uh -huh. 2011. And then that plus indies, and I was only at 50, you know, something thousand. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to think, you know, what you would have to double that total. Go, uh, those you yeah, have variant covers, uh, annuals. A lot of people don't collect all the annuals. Oh, I, 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 I do. <laughs> yeah, uh, golden age, tremendous amount of gold key. Um, the uh, oh gosh, the TV comics from the 60s that's probably around 5,000 comics. Okay, so that, that uh, so you have all those too. I mean, I, I was never able to you know get that. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I didn't really have an appreciate appreciation for those until later and by that time they were so freaking expensive that i just you know, couldn't pull the trigger on. that's what i screwed up on is uh the really high dollar uh the really high dollar uh horror from the atomic age mm -hmm. uh, that's really it's a shocking suspense stories and stuff like that and police comics now i'm starting to go back and grab them but they're so hard to get now in high grade and uh, shockingly expensive in uh, in high in even low grade. That uh, you know, I, I I focused on superheroes and everything else because I felt I figured that's what was going to be stupidly, and I was right. That was what was going to be stupidly expensive. And uh, then then the you know I just didn't have the focus <clears throat> for those two, and is like. By the time now that I've turned around and looked, I was like, holy shit, that's $40,000. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you're going to be damned if you do either way with that. I mean, either way. Either I mean, way. Because you know, 
the time is is our enemy with that stuff now it's it so much of its past that all that stuff is just through the roof so doc i gotta ask you you know um but I doc, see the pictures, doc, I see the pictures on social media you're very proud of your collection you have a man in the channel that's got a hundred two thousand in his personal collection that's not part of his store that he owns green uh, I, used to have fifty five thousand comics what are you sitting on buddy i'm only at 10 i got about ten thousand. i know i mean i'm just focused. Here disappointed I, i'm a little more focused yeah um you know but who damn you guys are that's impressive I mean, I, I gotta say that is, that is legitimately impressive. It, it puts my shit to shame. I'm uh, sitting on like a thousand. No. It's way too much for me. <laughs> you've you've got a you've got a very impressive you got a very impressive Marvel collection, Doc. And that's the uh, <sighs> that's 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 really. I mean, if I had to talk about the top ten thousand comics that I have, it would be Marvel collection. <laughs> you know, Marvel Marvel and Golden Age DC. It'd be like. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> there. About okay, 10 yeah, to 15,000 comics, you know, yeah. that, I, that, that I really go. Yeah. That's, that's my, that's my core of my collection right there. Yeah. I mean, like I have my, my almost complete X-Men one through uncanny one through 600, including variants, reprints and, uh, you know, any obscure, annuals and stuff like that um i think i'm down to about like 60 books to to finish that off um mm -hmm. all the rest of my x stuff is almost if not 100 complete i do have uh the one thing that i am kind of proud of is the complete Wildstorm universe from start to finish yeah, uh, yeah. because i i really did enjoy wild storm is still my favorite uh imprint yeah, it's it's well, I mean, it's like my favorite universe. Um, I mean, it was kind of its own because it was kind of its own thing for a little while. Um, you know, I, I tried to do a full top cow universe, but then I realized that a lot of the supernatural stuff I, I, I don't care about. Oh, Pele, you got a good question. We got a question mm -hmm. for the for the viewers. This is like, like I said, it's a little bit different. If you have questions, we'll answer. Ask. It. Yeah, here's really. here's your question, Pele. What's your rarest comic in your collection? I've got a couple of one-offs uh, from uh, the '40s that were uh, prototypes, that you know, ash cans that were never released to the public. But uh, this, it's 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 really hard to, it's really hard to quantify as far as what other interest would be in those comics uh, because they were from either failed publishers or you know, self-published stuff. Uh, Detective Number One. Uh, is probably one of the rarest that people would actually know about. Uh, I've got a uh, I've got a five point five point oh of uh, of debt number one. Um, it's probably the rarest of the major titles. Uh, Detective Twenty Seven. I got the the Golden Age Golden Age Batman Detective Run. Uh, but uh, but Detective Number One probably because it's the one that. It's the one that the uh, major golden collectors are like, you got that? Can I see it? <laughs> Can I see it? You know, it's the it's at the Fu Manchu cover and everything on, and everybody's like, ooh. So how many 5.5s and above are out there? Are we talking like in the hundreds? Oh, four. Okay. <laughs> so we're, we're talking a handful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a comic that, you know, no, nobody cared about. I mean, you had a really high print run. But it didn't have the, you know, well, yeah, there's, there's, there's three, four, four, 5.5s, uh, three, 6.0s, four, 6.5s. And that's, you know, counting restored, you know, mine, mine is a restored copy, uh, but, uh, not heavily, heavily restored, but, um. but anyway, so did I hear right, correctly uh, that you have a detective 27? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a debt twenty seven. I bought it. I bought that uh, not long after uh, uh, the the Mike Keaton Batman film uh, is like. Well, I've got money right now. Uh, it was recently after a real estate sale, and I was like, you know, 
I better do this. I, I better do this now while I'm flush. I didn't know that I was going to have some, I was going to have financial success, you know, success later in life. You know, I just kind of had to strike while the iron was hot and uh, find the best grade copy I could at the time. But, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that was right after, right after the Keaton Batman. And it was reasonable according to, you know, well, by today's, today's numbers. Yeah. Yeah. All was, right. Doc. Fraction. You got the next question. My cousin would like to start reading X Men and Wolvie. Where is she to start? That's from uh, Ballyender. Um, I would say that, especially if he if he doesn't mind spending a little bit of money, because a lot of this stuff you can find for reasonable prices, especially if you're looking for reader copies. I would say at Uncanny ninety four, um, ninety four. Up through, so you wouldn't start at giant size X Men. Uh, well, okay, yeah, you know what? Go pick up a facsimile copy of giant sized X Men number one, and Good call. and then, um, because if it's just about reading, if it's about collecting, that's that's wholly different. Um, if it's just about reading, you can find reasonable copies of most of these things, and you can start it. You know, giant size with a copy of a facsimile of X Men. Uh, what if he wants a collection? Where? What collection should he start with? Uh, if he wants, if he wants a collection, I, I I'd buy an X Men one as soon as possible because it's just going to keep going up. It's going to keep getting stupid. No, no, I mean um, collection like collected in a graphic. Oh, novel. It oh, sounds oh, like he just oh, wants oh, him to oh, start oh, reading X Men. Oh, like and in, in like in like trades and hardcovers. Yeah. Um, well, actually, you know what? Uh, Marvel's going to be releasing the that giant X Men box. Oh yeah, uh, that comes out real soon. I mean, it's like five hundred bucks, but you can probably I think you can find it on Amazon for like three fifty already. But it's mm -hmm. basically got everything from Giant Size, or actually, I think. No, it's got everything from X Men One up through uh, about issue four hundred, like three hundred or four hundred. It's Damn. it's it's extensive, <clears throat> and it's all in hard covers. It's all the um, uh, it's it's in a giant box set. Um, it's called the X Men Children of the Atom box. It's it's coming out relatively soon, um, or or you could probably course, do it on. Uh, what is it? Uh, Chris Claremont and Frank Miller's Wolverine story, yeah. right? Yeah, and then Claremont and Miller's Wolverine miniseries. You can pick that up in a uh, in you know trade for hell. You can probably find it at half price books. Yeah, um, it looks like they're like two small short boxes. Looks like they're about the size of two small short boxes from what I'm seeing on the, the retailer crap. Yeah. And I mean, it looks good. It, it, oh, looks, like, it looks like a great, great collection. Uh, I, I'm going to skip it because I have most of it already in either other hard covers or, you know, on the. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Hiccup. Uh, or. In, in in single issues I have it all in single issues but a lot of them I also have in like omnibus and hard covers um, you, you can also go with the masterworks but those are going to be in you know they're all black and white yeah mm -hmm. the epic collections the same thing that's probably going to be a, the children of the atom box set if it, if it follows the trajectory of any of the others that I've seen that are similar that's going to be a really nice investment too because they're not going to put they're not going to print it through the roof uh, it's going to have a it's going to have a modest print run comparatively, and yeah. some of those are now pushing somewhere in the neighborhood of about a thousand to twelve hundred bucks. So, Doc, yeah. is there any truth that um Dan DiDio you know instinctively canceled that project before he was told it wasn't his? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he just he he's he just you know canceled everything and then, <laughs> and, then sure, and then somebody not? had to tell him you you don't work for marvel you don't have you don't have pro, you don't have rights <laughs> over at, at the x -Men. all right ash debbie smoker wants to know what's your favorite comic if we're talking old school comics which seems to be the theme of what's going on um it is absolutely unequivocally the chris claremont run on x-men 
which uh, I'm sad that I don't own all of it. Um, I own a lot of it going back into the early 100s, but as you get close to 94, <laughs> it gets expensive, uh, at least for my particular comic budget. Um, and then as the years have gone on, it just hasn't, it doesn't get cheaper. <laughs> but um, I have most of it, and uh, it's, it's, I started reading X Men around, uh, well, my first X Men comic was 162, but I didn't start collecting comics until issue 210. And then I just started going backwards and forwards from 210. So I just went, and it was it was a great joy to read X Men that way, um, and you know it got me into comics. Outside of that, I ventured in a lot of Marvel stuff. Um, I'd say outside of X Men, um, my favorite books. I liked some of the more obscure stuff that Marvel did. Uh, Grew the Wanderer was a big classic favorite of mine growing up. Sergio. Um, um, the Nom Marvel did this comic series called The Nom back in the eighties. I remember that, it. That came out of nowhere with Michael Golden um doing the art, and it was just when I looked at it as a kid, I was like, I don't want to read some book about you know. My dad was a Vietnam vet. I was like, yeah, but it was kind of hot. So as a little kid, I was like, ah, you know, it's everyone's wants it, and it's gonna you know number one's going up in price. So I went and grabbed them all, and I started reading them, and they were fantastic books. Um. So I gravitated towards a lot of that stuff. Most of the mainstream. Oh, Thor. Thor, Frank Miller, Daredevil run uh, during that era in the 80s is among my favorite oh, comics Thor, of all time. Simonson? So I'm, yes, I'm conflating the two, actually. Walt Simonson's Thor run, uh, D Frank Miller's Daredevil run were similar era, close. Um, and so those were, when I think about this time in comics, I think of Claremont's X Men, Frank Miller's Daredevil. Um, and Walt Simonson's Thor run, uh, being the epitome of what I loved in comic books. And then in Independence, my favorite is, uh, and it goes back this far. It's, uh, it's Usagi Ojimbo. I talk about it today at comics 35 years and still running. Um, and I discovered it back in the eighties and, uh, it, another comic that I was like, wow, it's this goofy little rabbit that everyone's interested in. And I started reading it and never looked back. Awesome. Yeah, so that was, that next was, that question was really got me. In, that's actually what got me into indies real heavy back in the day. Rash was you oh, saw cool. it, you so epic docs. We're going to send this one to Breen because it sounds like a Breen question. If I ever heard one, uh, we've heard recently about what writers do to fail uh, being true to characters. What old school moment is your favorite character defining issue or moment? Right, I'm, I'm going to take a couple characters. I'm going to start with Spider-Man. I'm going to go with issue 33. When he's buried under all of that steel and you know, it's the water's pouring in and he wants to give up, but he's got Aunt May's medicine. And he has to get it to her and he just summons enough strength to, you know, to and, and Ditko stretches it out over almost like half an issue where he summons resolve and he finally just pushes all of the weight off of him. And maybe one of the greatest single, you know, one page, you know, one splash page panel in comics history. And if anybody's read, you know, that issue, they know what I'm talking about. Um, Recreated in the recent movie, correct? Right. I believe they did. Yeah. Um, yeah it's in far from home. It's not far from it's, home. Homecoming. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. I said, I just, just one of the greatest, you know, moments I've ever, I've ever read. And the other one I'm going to go with is Captain America. And there, there have been a bleep ton of character defining moments for him. But the one that sticks out for me is, in Avengers 177, it's the it's the last issue of the Korvac saga, and he's already basically killed every everyone from Thor, Iron Man, you know, all the Guardians, all the Avengers, and the last man standing is Captain America, and he's he's not even he's not calling him Korvac, he's not even calling him Michael, he's just saying he's just calling him Mike, and he says, you know, he goes, I'm not a Superman, I'm just a man, but this man is going to you know, do what everybody else couldn't. And, and, and for, you know, a couple of panels, he's actually getting the better of this, you know, cosmic godlike being. And then finally, you know, obviously he, you know, defeats him because he goes, you have, of all these, you, know, you have out of everyone actually managed to hurt me. And, you know, it's just, and if you remember the story, he didn't, you know, it turns out he was actually almost in the right, 
you know, with what he wanted to do. But it's like, yes, yeah, like Captain America did what no, what God's armored, you know, just massively powered people couldn't do. And it just, you know, that was to me that that's Captain America. Awesome. All right, Doc, you've already answered this one, so we'll be quick on it. Uh, QWERTY said, without getting into collection and stuff like that, is there a, a best point, chronolog chronologically speaking, that's a good to jump into X-Men, say, after House of Them or something? Um, I'd say if you're just going to go buy single issues um, <clears throat> for for cheapness and plentiful, I, I'd say you can start in the 200s and work your way up um, outside of 221. Everything is going to be relatively cheap. Um, you know, anywhere between maybe three and 10 bucks. Uh, issue 266 is the first gambit. You can pick up a facsimile copy if you're just looking to read. Um, but if you're looking for more modern X-Men, then yeah, around, around the time of the end of house of X or house of house of M, sorry, would be, would be relatively good. Um, uh, one good thing, uh, the, uh, one hundreds, if, as long as you aren't going for like near mint grade or you know something like that down in the one hundreds, like one fifty and above, as long as you're not talking about some specific key issues, they're still well under like, you know, good, very good, you know, still under like five to, or about five bucks. So, or yeah, like, you, you can pick up a lot of the, anything over like one fifty for, cause outside of maybe like one ninety three, uh, one 164 is a little pricey. Two twelve for uh, binary saber tooth. Yeah. I mean, th there's, but, but you can find them relatively cheap, um, especially low grade. But if you're if you're looking for just reader copies, yeah, there, there's none of them are are, are are stupid expensive, you know, maybe 15, 20 bucks. All right, next question is from Magic MX. This is definitely a Pele question. Uh, what site does the panel recommend for collecting comics? As far as uh, you're talking about a guide, a price guide, or something like that. I'm assuming it's yes. Okay. Uh, as far as platform is concerned, the one that most people are really going to look at as far as raw comic values and stuff like that is probably going to be comicspriceguide.com. Uh, it's updated very frequently. Uh, they've got a new uh, content editor there that's uh, gotten on the stick and he's being a lot more, he's, he's, he's getting a lot more accurate as far as street values and stuff like that. Uh, realistic values, comic comics price dot uh, price guide.com another good one is cb is a uh, comic book realm uh they're fantastic uh the, you'll see a lot of you know you'll see a lot of variety that may not be on on uh comics price guide uh comic book realm uh for slabbed comics go collect they have the best up-to-date pricing as far as tools for price history and trading and stuff like that uh, that'd be gocollect.com. You know what? If you just look at eBay sold prices, yeah, that's that's often that's also resource. really excellent. Yeah. yeah. So search for whatever book you're looking for. Check the sold price, not not what everybody's asking. Don't worry about that. Yeah. But go, well, gocollect consolidates the eBay yeah. sales now, uh, but, and also heritage raw. and stuff like that. But that's 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 when you get into the nosebleed stuff. You know? Yeah. But stuff. but just for but just for like raw random single issues. Yeah, comicspriceguide.com. Sweet. Also, FF2 is asking. This is an Ash. Well, it's a really every everyone question. I think we all like these characters, but I think this is an Ash specialty. Any good Daredevil and Spider comics from back then? Oh yeah, <laughs> the best Daredevil run, in my opinion, ever is the the Frank Miller run, and you get it even before he started writing when he was just doing the art uh, and it just builds up from there and it just gets better and better until it ends off in uh, the born. I think it's born again. I think I, I get them mixed up with all these born names, um, but it ends in this one of the greatest story arcs in comic book history and born again. Um, absolutely getting the dare to, I mean, and, and these aren't even really expensive. If you're looking to collect comics and you want to have, they're not necessarily like key comics, but they're like classic books that you will be proud to have in your collection. You can get them and Breen will tell you he found a bunch of Daredevil Miller Daredevils for pennies on the dollar. You can you can come be lucky and find these books. They're not 
they're not sought after collectors items but comic collectors will look at them and be like oh yeah mm, good you have that uh, and they're, well, and they're be, super to will read. be someday yeah someday, someday for sure gonna go back and they're gonna yeah go, yeah oh these are too cheap <laughs> uh the other thing we're talking about spider-man uh i'm sure these other guys have their their favorites and stuff but my what i came in to love spider-man is dave michelini's run and uh dave michelini when he <laughs> met up with a little known guy called todd mcfarlane and they started uh just before issue 300 and did a fantastic run of spider-man then todd of course went on to get his own book which wasn't as good but eric larson picked up the reins and then had another fantastic run of spider-man um you can't go wrong if you can pick up those the, the Mc, those mcfarlane issues might be more expensive to pick up but those fantastic that's great era comics yeah yeah the, the spawn, right, spawn spawn was not as good as 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 his as his spider-man that's true mm -mm. It's, it's a high it's bar to, high bar to exceed teddy smoke is i guess he's gonna ask me who's your favorite superhero family in marvel and dc minor flash and uh superman all right, so Marvel's easily, it's Fantastic Four. It's uh, excellent family dynamics. Love the whole team, uh, especially uh, Ben Grimm. The Thing is actually one of my favorite characters. And then from uh, DC, it's much more recent. It was when uh, Superman and Lois had Jonathan Kent, much like what you're saying. I think is probably the perfect superhero family, and I like the, the way that um, Peter J. Tomasi was fleshing out uh, Superman and Lois's trials as a mother and a father with the I wouldn't call them special needs, but it's a special powered child that uh, definitely uh, they didn't know exactly what was going to happen with him. So I thought the dynamics on that and the whole story was amazing. And it's um, it's heartbreaking what Brian Michael Bendis has done to all that hard work and yeah. the amazing foundation that Peter J. Tomasi left for him to do great things with. All right. This is for you, Doc. Speaking of X Men, who enjoyed Nicienza's uh, run in the '90s? Did you? I really did. I I think you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of people that say that, yeah, you know, the X Men kind of went to crap after Claremont left. Honestly, I I I don't think so. I mean, I know Ash is probably going to disagree with me on this. I, I don't think the X Men really started going to crap until around House of X, or not House. Of, I keep saying House of X, House of M. Um. <laughs> No, I, I I I liked uh Fabian's run. I I really liked Scotty Lobdell's run. I know a lot of other people don't. And I liked uh Joe Kelly and Steven Siegel's run. That chuck off. Lobdell was yeah. in a bad position, like to follow <laughs> the greatest writer ever, probably on one property. Yeah, you know what? A lot of these guys, they they were they were left trying to pick up a lot of the pieces after after Chris left. Um <clears throat> because he had what's Look, let's look back on it and, and see how many plates was that man spinning at once with plots and subplots. And sometimes an entire issue was nothing but advancing some subplots with with the, the main X-Men just talking about something. They, they didn't do anything. All the action was in the subplots. Um, you know, it was, there was a little bit of character advancement on the, on the, on the main book, but he had so many plates spinning at all times. I mean, he had subplots that would go, that were going back a hundred, 200 issues when, when he left and somebody's trying to put all these pieces together and actually come up with a coherent narrative. The only guy that really knew what he was doing was, was Chris. Have you guys seen the Claremont documentary? I did. the The one that's on uh, the, it's on yeah. Amazon. Yeah. the The Chris Claremont's X Men. It's really good. It is. Yeah. yeah if you it, it, for everybody in the chat, if you've not watched that, if you have Amazon Prime, it's on there. It's it's a great documentary. It's him and um, Wheezy. And um, and Asante and Asante, yeah, they look pretty Please good. I gotta that. say, a Annie <laughs> Annie looks hot. Annie's still yes, hot. She did. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, just because Doc mentioned me, um, I actually did respect Lobdell and Nessie's run after Claremont. Um, they they it wasn't as good, but you know what, you do the best you can, and I and I did enjoy it. And 
Uh, Lobdell has written one of my favorite X Men stories ever with the Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix. And uh, Nessieza did some really solid stuff on the ongoing. Yeah. All right. So, Pele, you were a huge supporter of this series. Uh, it says, what would you like to see for the Hulk after Immortal Hulk, which seems to be winding down? I would say the bloom is off that rose, and Hulk is going to have to go in a, a new direction with a new creator. What would you like to see for Hulk? I'd like to see uh, <clears throat> the addressing the, uh, the different versions of the Hulk. A little bit, a little bit more cohesion, a little bit more backstory into, to uh, <clears throat> the variations on those and how they're, you know, a little bit more into how they're triggered, you know, what, you know, maybe see what I think would be cool is to have them all at the same time interacting with each other. You know, it's like, you know, they just pull them all out together and they're all like in the same world at the same time, if the world could actually handle it. And how they would deal with each other, and you know, as far as on a on a personal level, if, if they didn't just try to kill each other immediately, you know. But uh, I, I think that would be cool because they, they've they've already delved now into, you know, the the darker aspects of uh, of uh, the Savage Hulk. So uh, you know, uh, something something within a more modern context now of like Joe Fix It. And, Is there a writer that you would like to take over for Al Ewing? Oh gosh! Pick me. Uh oh, Breen's got one. Who's the one you want to see on it? Go ahead, Breen. I believe the well, in my opinion, the greatest Hulk writer in history is currently on the payroll. Absolutely, being given side Spider-Man miniseries. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about giving Peter David a crack at him yeah, again? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I was so, going to say before. Before that, yeah. Would you want him with Dale Keown, or do you want him still with Joe Bennett? I'd be good either way, honestly. I mean, if they, if Dale wants to come back, or you know, Gary Frank did a lot of those, but then it'd have to go. You know, he's a DC guy now. Yeah, well, it'd have to go quarterly. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> I thought so. I thought Dale Keown was back. I thought I saw him on. He he did do that one that one shot. He did a, a Hulk book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I know he did the one shot, but I thought I saw him do an ongoing issue. Oh really? I know. I, I looked through it. I I looked and I was like, wait. Right. I can't that one shot that. wasn't that good, and then I looked at the. I was like, "Oh, this is like old school Dale Keown. He's getting the magic back." You, you know why I didn't look through it, Ash? Because it wasn't why? a back issue. There you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So, on that note, Joel L. Rand is saying, "I'm buying back issues. The hell with new ones. The man's got a point." Although there aren't good mm -hmm. new comics out there, but if you want to sing the praises of back issues, you've come to the right place. Uh, also with us is Ryan Wilson. Didn't know you had live videos. Awesome. Normally these are on Saturday, but this is a special comics aficionados on Sunday because I was out on a trip and I didn't make it back in time. So yes, every Saturday morning, we normally have a show and it's all well thought out. But today we're talking to the, to, uh, to the channel viewers and answering the questions. And we're having a good time. And Ryan Wilson is a new comics reader. He, I see him in the, the the comments of the of the channel videos a lot. Has a lot of great points, great questions. So definitely encourage him to keep reading comics because this is the best hobby in the world. Absolutely. And uh -huh. I did I did see Ryan talk about you know some of the omnis for the uh, Claremont Lee. X-Men, you don't need to buy the Omnis for that. You can find all of that stuff in back issue bins for relatively cheap. They're they they were they had so many. They were this is back when they were printing and selling, you know, 500,000 copies for a random issue 264 or something. Yeah. So, you can you can find these issues in back issues for oh. for cheap. Probably even more than that, but that was that was like Sylvester numbers when Jim Lee was on board. They were like getting close to a million. Oh yeah, X Men number one was just just and then X Men number one, of course, did like the eight million. But you know, like absurd, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but those those Jim Lee when Jim Lee started getting hot, everyone was buying X Men. It was just yeah, there's so I many issues. It, out I there. thought it was hilarious that X Men had those individual covers and stuff like that. Each one of those covers was like at the time was like a top ten comic published i mean it was <laughs> every single one of them like oh this is the eighth most published comic this is the ninth most published comic you know it's like oh my 
<laughs> stupid. But uh, but pe- they they sold. People bought them like that. I mean, and well, stores bought them like that. Uh, uh-huh. As far as actual sell through the customers, is probably about half. So. Yeah, there's, still, right. there's still comic Next. shops that have oh I was just gonna say there's there's uh, still comic shops that have like long boxes of X-Men number one in the back. So. <laughs> yeah. Next question Including from FF2. My... Uh who would you like to write Spider-Man after Nick Spencer? Me personally, I would like to see Patrick Gleason write it. I think he's a he's a good writer. He did a lot of good stuff in Superman with Tomasi. Uh Pele, who would you like to see after Nick Spencer? Oh boy, uh, I would I would really like to see it go back to. Uh, uh, I'd like actually I'd like to see Chip Zdarsky. Well, Ditto. Second bit, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Chip Zdarsky, like Spider Man, make it happen. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'd like yeah, to see Zdarsky. He seems to be the one that can really bring a character it, right back to its roots, and to to really you know to to build goodwill back into a character again and that's kind of what we need right now and and if you and read life story you know he understands the character <laughs> like absolutely and he has he does. written the best individual issue of spider-man probably in the last 10 years yes absolutely he has peter parker spectacular pirate spider-man 310 do we get it right this time doc that's right yes <laughs> <laughs> we keep going uh, we need to do 301 308 it's, it's, it's yeah, 310 so, <laughs> all right. So we do have a four ninety nine super chat from Josh, also known as SSJ Future Gohan six two zero nine three. What era of DC do you think is best? Uh, for me, I think Rebirth there is the best. Like I think it's hard to beat that much quality in, in one two year uh, span. A lot of great writers on great titles. I have a special place for Rebirth in my heart. For Breen, how uh, good do you think DC was in the eighties? You know, as, as much as I like Rebirth, I'm going to go with the about the five years that you know followed Crisis because they they really made an effort to make everything that they were doing all fit together. I mean, yeah, you know, the I, I'm particularly partial to the Bwahaha Justice League you know, run. Um, I, I thought Burn and Wolfman's Superman those first three or four years were you know. Yeah, fantastic. You know, Batman Detective were were very solid. Um, and then a lot of the other series, you know, Grell's Green Arrow, um, Denny O'Neill, you know, and Dennis Cowan's question, even like your know, books that you'd have never paid attention to in the past, you know, that they really, you know, did did well with you. Know, the, the Teen Titans had a little bit of a resurgence. Um uh, so I mean I, I think you know, I I pretty much liked everything they did for about yeah, you know, five years or so. Yeah, this new Teen Titans, speaking of Teen Titans, this new series has been phenomenal. Uh, with some One of the stinkers. Best kept secrets in comics. Yeah. Well, a few stinkers along the way, but not many. And it's it's a really, really well done series. The rebirth of Teen Titans. It's it's been it's been really fantastic. I've enjoyed it. All right, Doc. We know you're more of a Marvel X-Men guy. I'm gonna throw this one to you. Josh wants to know. John Burns, Superman. I'm assuming that's Man of Steel or Marv Wolfman, George Perez's new Teen Titans. Which one's better? Ooh, I'd have to say the Wolfman Perez Teen Titans. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh oh, Breen's pissed. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say, I said, that's like choosing between children. I, I, I <laughs> know, but but the, the Wolfman Perez Teen Titans, it, it had a lot of that same. Um, I guess the this similar DNA to the the you know 80s X-Men. Oh no question about that. And, and what it also does, you know, if you're if you're a fossil, as a lot of people like to point out that I am, and was reading <laughs> new comics at the time, and you know, I was there when that came out, and it was just so radically different from everything DC was doing at, at the time because you you know, and, and DC did have some books in the late seventies where they were like toying with continuity. It just really wasn't in the bigger titles. So, you know, but, and then that just, that felt like a Marvel book. It, it looked like a Marvel book. It read like one. And, it, it, but so did, so did burn Superman. I mean, that was, you know, that was just so different from everything DC was doing. So I said, I mean, those are two great examples. I don't know that I could honestly choose between the two. 
All right. So everyone likes that. All right. So I want to say thank you very much to Josh for the super chat. Really appreciate the questions. We got a nice debate. And you put Breen. He's stumped. He's got no answer. He can't choose between new Teen Titans and Man of Steel from John You noticed it didn't stop me from blathering. Well, absolutely not. That's what we do, baby. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So this is an Ash question, if I've ever heard one. How would you retcon Bendis' Superman and fix the Superman family? How would you do it, Ash? Oh, dang. Um, Well, uh, um. Um, I know how to fix Jonathan Kent. Um, I, that that that's kind of easy actually. Uh, so I'm gonna give half an answer because I I don't have an answer how to fix Superman right now. Um, it's early in the morning for me, but I've thought about the Jonathan Kent. So he's part of the family, and this is how I'd do it. I would go back to uh, S- Scott uh, Snyder's Metal series where we learned about the Dark Multiverse, and everyone's like, oh, you know, everyone's kind of, and I get it, but. During Bendis's run, we learned that little uh, John went into space and got lost in age seven years. And what happened to him? Well, he was stuck in Earth two or three, one of those. What one? I forget which one. He and then on, he came back, yeah. and he had the sin- the the, yeah, the the evil syndicate after him. We find out that actually, you don't even need to use metal. You could just say he's Earth three John Kent if you wanted to. But uh, basically, he's not John Kent. We the the John Kent that came back is not who we thought and maybe as i'm brainstorming right now that could snap superman out of his funk that he's going through where he's deciding that he's going to do with all the things that he's doing and realize holy shit what a s- terrible father i've been my son is still trapped out there i've got to save my son and have this heroic story of superman going through the multiverses to save his 10 year old son john kent and have a great adventure. And when they come back and it finally is all over, it's reverts and uh, we get the old uh, Smiths. If you remember the Clark and Lois Smith, uh, they're not technically, they still keep the Kent name, obviously, but you know, th- that family and it just settles back nice and easy. And everyone just, it's like one of those traumas and you have in your family. No one just talks about it anymore. They just move forward positively. Um, that's, Ash? Yeah. W- would you have, would you also put in that the Lois that came back wasn't the real Lois? The Lois that came back from... Yeah, because didn't she go out in space with John and then come back and then she didn't tell story. Clark that she was back? Uh, but she yeah. came back right away. I don't know if that's important because... But she's Lois such is, a bitch. She is. She's, she's but, you know, bitch. her son's <laughs> messed up and they just they just lost their minds and they, they refocus... Um, that's that's kind of how I would do it. I'm sorry if that's not a, the best answer, but um, it's hard when you have things like this. You have to really reach deep to try to figure out ways to to correct things, or just do Bobby Ewing in the shower, or have Boom. another crisis. Maverick MX is asking what modern indie title would have skyrocketed has been released in the 80s and 90s. So when I think 80s and 90s, I think bombastic, over the top action and and things of that nature. The one indie comic that kind of meets that for me is Die, Die, Die by Robert Kirkman. Mm. I think that would have kind of fit in, although it's political satire, which really wouldn't have. But the, the premise and the execution, the the absolute fun of that, it, that is an, an absolutely violently fun comic book. What do you think? Am I, am I somewhere on the right track, Ash? Yeah, I think, I think that book is actually kind of almost a uh, love letter to the 90s. And I think the, the political satire isn't quite so strong. I think there were indie books doing a lot of that political satire type uh, in the '90s as well. So I, I, I do I, the art style probably wouldn't have, but no, whatever. The story, yeah, the story that the the style of the book, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think you're you hit it on the head. Pele, you were saying something. Do you have another one, or were you? Uh, did you have an opinion on Die Die Die? Oh yeah, it's it's definitely a throwback to the to those to those books. You know, it's 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 like you said, a love letter. It it really is just uh, that visceral kind of you know crazy over the top wildness. You know that 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 I think really does sort of typify that era. So you're right. That's that's probably the best one. What the, modern the old the old guard saying I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> as far as as far yeah as far as uh typifying that era yeah absolutely it's 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 uh you know the, I, i'm not really into the p- 
political aspects of it, but uh, you know, that's, that's not my thing, but yeah, it does. It does. All right, doc, this is for you. This is more of a, a an observation than a question. Ryan Wilson saying, uh, Brian Hill is writing Batman, the outsiders of DC and X-Men. Actually it's fallen angels, not Marauders, but we'll do this anyway for Marvel. Both are great. Uh, I like, well, Marauders next force right now, the, the most of all X-Men series. What do you think about Brian Hill dipping his toe into the DC, the Marvel? Well, I and mean, he's doing indie comics as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> honestly, I, I think that Brian Hill's one of those guys that he, he's one of the few writers these days that is able to, he learns the voice of the characters and is able to write in their voice, not, not stuffing his voice into their mouth. Um, a lot, a lot of modern writers are, you know, they're guilty of, of making, making the, the characters into just themselves. And he's, he's good at finding who those characters are and bringing them out. Um, and I think, I think that's, it's it's a commendable trait. It's one of the reasons why, and if his name's on something, I will buy it. Period. Um, so even though, since, yeah, go ahead. Since we know uh, he's Ryan is a more new newer reader, I would suggest if you like Brian Hill and you want to see him, you know, without the chains off, you know, the DC and Marvel overlords, go check out Aphrodite, Aphrodite Five. I believe it's Top Cow. Yep, it's a really cool comic, a really cool story. And Cyber the Force. Not as is great, but and also I know you like Cyberforce. I do. I did like Cyberforce. I'm still waiting for the last issue. I, I don't know. I don't know whatever happened to it. I know it was solicited and then it was canceled. And I, I want issue 12. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, and, you're looking for some cool Brian Hill. There's some great stuff out on the indies. Yeah. And um apparently I haven't read it, but apparently Postal is really good. I've heard I've heard nothing but great things about Postal. It's an inter it's an interesting, but if you're looking for like superhero like action stuff, not that one, but it's like a okay. a small town that's being like, I think their mayor has, is it Asperger's? I have no idea. I've never read I it. I, I just it heard. Is. I've just heard good things about it. No, it's a, it's a good story. It's not. It's just not what you typically find in comic uh, books. You know, it's okay. kind of like when you read Criminal and you're like, ah, oh, this is a little different. You know, I, yeah, I really like it's executed well, but it's not. Exactly what you're thinking, but yeah, Postal's a, a good one as well. I believe that's also from Top Cow with uh, okay. Matt Hawkins. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I I I know it is from Top Cow. Um, but yeah, I liked Cyberforce. I liked the, uh, you know what? I I liked. I even liked his one issue of uh, the Miles Morales Spider Man that he did. That was the annual. Mm -hmm. It was still good. Yep. <clears throat> yep. That was a good one as well. All right, Black Cat, what do you make of Jason Fabok hinting three Jokers got delayed due to decisions by the powers at DC and that the project was leaked before he and Johns wanted it to be announced? Uh, they wanted to, it, to finish two issues first. Paley, what do you say to that? Uh-oh, Paley's gone. <laughs> he's, he's muted. Sorry about that. I, I muted it because I had a coughing fit earlier. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think he's dead on. Uh, that because Didio's an asshole, and uh, it's just it's it's sad. It's 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 just infighting and politics and crap like that involved right now over there in, in DC. And uh, and I don't know if I know it eventually will happen. You know, it's like Doomsday Clock was eventually going to always be released, but it'll be dribbled out to the point to where you know some people fall off or they lose interest or forget. And, yeah, it's just if you're it seems to me, now I'm not gonna say it's absolutely the case, but it seems to me that if you're not within a certain set group of people, creators over at DC, that they just mess with you. And uh they uh they try to they try to mess with creators that aren't part of their click, part of the primary click. And uh to the point where they you know they, they either leave or uh they they, they kowtow and and, and you know, kiss the ring. So it's, uh, I think it's a bad state over there. And uh, until certain people are gone, I don't think it's going to improve. It does really seem like there's a lot of undermining going on over there. And uh, it's, it's really sad to see that uh, 
something that is being allowed to happen because it's it's Jeff Johns is definitely in a position of power at DC. I mean, he's still helping to write the the movies, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. There's no one bigger at DC as far as that goes. I mean, as much as Bendis could, you know, flaunt, you know, fluff his feathers and be like, oh, look at me, I'm controlling these all the Superman. It's like Bendis, you know, Johns is like, hold my beer, you know, I'm writing movies. Um, but yeah. I think Didio realizes he can't compete head to head on that. And I feel like they just like, well, we'll just keep sabotaging your books and eventually we'll be able to, you know, explain, Oh, why didn't it sell John's? We're sorry. You know, you wrote your thing and no one. And it's like, it's like they want these books to fail. They're like trying hard. Like doomsday clock kept succeeding. And it was like, well, we're going to make it three months late this time and see if it sells. Oh my God. It sold the It was number one again. All right. We're going to delay it indefinitely. You know, like it's kept, it's like, what are you doing? Like, what? Let's get. <sighs> yeah, the brutality involved. <laughs> is absolutely I just, I vicious. can't believe this is allowed to happen. It's, it's so crazy. Uh, it looks yeah, like we yeah. lost Wes. Um, yeah, and Doc, Doc, Doc had to step away for a minute. All right, but well. uh, the. Uh, oh, by by the way, my 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 wife was wondering uh, at. Uh, this is directed towards Breen. Does does Steve does Steve Shrippa know that you stole his face? <laughs> who steve shrippa the uh the the actor the the gangster actor on the sopranos looks just breen looks just like him. <laughs> i yeah i i guess i'm not that far into the series because i'm about halfway through season two um, but, i'm the uh, only person I'm, I'm the one person that still hasn't seen sopranos i haven't seen oh, it oh i'm the other God. person that's, high you, five you, eric breen Woo. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, my my wife just walked in. She looked at the monitor and she's like, "Oh my god, <laughs> he looks just like this." What's that anyway. Sopranos guy doing on your live stream? Yeah, she's like, "What in the heck?" No, she, then she realized, "Oh wait, he's too young." But uh, uh, th th thank you, Mrs. 60s. Pele. I have, uh, I never hear that anymore. So thank you. But uh, anyway, the. No, it's it's really sad what's going on at DC, and it's 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 I've heard it's rooted in politics, and uh, it's a it's basically a power struggle over there, and uh, I think unfortunately the uh, the wrong team won, and uh, it's set B DC back now, and now we're we're in DC's Marvel nowadays, <coughs> and the the good news is is that will eventually end. The bad news is. Will it end before DC ends? And uh, I think that some of the personalities over there are so are so narcissistic in certain ways. And talk about Didio and and Bendis and King. That will they will they allow those other you know creators to have any any room to breathe? And uh, you know will they be allowed to continue? You know and eventually run dc completely into the ground so that's a that's a sad state i wish somebody i wish somebody with more authority than than didio would just step in and say hey you know we're gonna work this out you know well that's just maybe, it. do you do you think there's any chance that whoever owns dc you know might go to jeff johns at some point and say look i know you've kind of moved on but you know, this, you know, we've kind of noticed that our comics division is really starting to go south. Will you go in there and fix that and you have total autonomy? Do you think there's any chance that could ever happen? Because that's really the only shot we have of getting Portland out of D.C. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that I don't know if he would want that now. That's uh, the other because, problem. You know, is, does he have the patience to deal with that? And it's it's something that and there's, you're talking about, you know, a a a a bench depth as far as you know people that they've got creators on board, you know, so many of them now have been handpicked by Didio, and now Bendis's Portland Mafia is in there, and you know King and his people, and you know, you basically have to strip it to the walls and uh and rebuild from scratch i think and you know is there the will to do that and uh i don't know if johns has that will to do that but at least right now you've still got snyder venditti abnett jurgens mm -hmm. um tynan uh well that's the wall that's what i was trying to strip yeah, so, the wall. so yeah the i'm wall. saying but, but at least they're still there if 
you know, God help them if those guys all just decide to, you know, take off and then it'll be that much harder to get the band back together. And then at some point do they just say, you know, because I think that's what the Dio and Bendis are, are attempting to do is drive everybody out that actually disagrees with them or better translation that can actually write good comics and just leave that bunch. And then, you know, whoever's left to look at it and go, well, we, what can we do now? If we get rid of them, we've got nothing left. I think that's what they're going for. Exactly. Yeah, it's true. You've got, well, you've got the, the, the group that wants to turn DC completely into a political soapbox over here. And then you've got, you know, that's Bendis and his and his people and all that. All right. And then you've got the people that want to tell Let's stories. Huh? Let's wrap this conversation up and go to the next one. Go ahead. All right. Well, we're done with that one. Uh, I want to say apologize. I did have a power outage and it kicked me off, but I am back. Any good one shot issues I like recently. Nightwing uh, 43 was was great. And then uh, Detective Comics 1008. Ash, do you have any one comics one shot comic suggestions? Uh, I don't remember the issue number off the top of my head, but it was the detective. You guys might be able to help me. The detective comics was recently 1008 with the Joker. Yes. Um, that was a really uh, solid single issue book. Also, um, I, and I was much, I was big detractor of the Marvel 2099 non-event, but the, the one Zdarsky issue, the doom it book was really good. And the art was kind of failing, but, the story was really good, and if you happen to be a fan of the 2099 series from the 90s, that book was a nice like, little addition to it and kind of like gave you some insight to that. And, and you don't need to read it, if, but if you did read it, it, it has a little extra flavor. Um, so uh, those would be the two ones that I would, would speak out about. Mm-hmm. I, I do see that we're having some questions about uh, Leah Williams and Vita Ayala on new X-Men series. Uh, Doc and I literally just recorded an entire segment on this. It'll be out first thing in the morning. So we're probably going to avoid that one here because I literally just talked about it for 20 minutes before we did this. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else? Oh, well, this is a Pele question. Can you tell us about public domain? In the next 10 years, a lot of DC characters will become public domain. And supposedly that means anyone can write comics with those characters. Is that true, Pele? Uh, there are some copyright restrictions that are still going to be in place and you still got characters and, in, in, you know, settings and stuff like that, that are still going to be, you know, as far as modern settings and characters that are still going to be protected. But, you know, the base characters, uh, I, I'm not absolutely sure on copyright law, but, uh, yeah, the base characters that will be able to, um, to be able to write stories. Uh, I don't know as far as uh, those properties are concerned, whether or not they're going to be, um, gosh, whether they're going to be able to to expand upon them beyond a certain range. Uh, but I would imagine that you're going to see a lot more as far as third parties and stuff like that, as far as content. Maybe new, un maybe new worlds or new universes or new ideas that spring around those characters. One of the interesting things about public domain is they always move the goalposts further away. Uh, so I'm certain that that's a the, problem. The you know, quick, at Warner Brothers and and I won't uh, say problem. Warner Brothers, AT and T and Disney are hard at work trying to make sure that those characters never reach public domain, such as Superman. Correct. One of the things that they're trying to do right now, I know Disney is trying to do, is to say that well, you can't have public domain. They're trying to add it. And, and addendum to that, that public domain, uh, it would not become public domain as long as something has been published about that character within the last five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if that happens, nothing will hit public domain as far as anything, the, the, mo the, the, right. you know, Victorian era forward. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll be, it'll be a situation where, you know, the original creators, you know, will have a, will have a lockdown on everything. Uh, or the, the the people that own the rights now will. Real quick, but, this uh, is related to the super chat you're about to read. Do you think is a possibility that 5G might be influenced by the fact that their characters are going public domain and maybe they're like, we need new Batman, new Superman, you know, new stuff we can... You know, I don't They're think starting so. to plant seeds to have new characters. Okay. I, I wouldn't... 
So let's talk about that super chat from Josh. Uh, thank you very much. The rumor is that Snyder and Caputo refused a lot of the 5G stuff that DC, DC leadership wanted them to include in their upcoming event, uh, which we believe is called Death Metal Thoughts. Uh, I think this is very interesting. I'm not surprised. Uh, Snyder and Capullo are two of the people at DC Comics that do have clout, maybe not as much as Brian Michael Bendis and what has right now, but they certainly have a, a good amount. They really had the last event that hit for DC Comics that made a lot of money <laughs> with yeah. metal. Uh, last night on Earth was extremely profitable. You know, so basically every time that those two creators get together, they're basically printing money for DC Comics. So if there were two people that could say no, I believe Snyder and Capullo would be two of them. Do you have any uh, insider information or thoughts on that, Pele? Uh, I really don't, but I I will say I will say that uh, I think that that I would I wouldn't completely throw out the idea as far as public domain, but I don't think that's the primary motivator. Uh, the five uh, G right now seems to be. You know, like we were talking about before with the, you know, with the Marvel now and some of the other reboots that have happened that you've got, um, you know, they just they want to find new readership. They want to find new, you know, sources of, of, of revenue, I guess, from different audiences. And, you know, the problem is, is I think that a lot of those audiences stuff like that are just into different types of media and they're not going to be interested in just the written. They're not going to be interested in just the published page. So you've already got the people that are in comics right now. I think that that's probably three fourths of the people that would be in comics because of the people that seek out that kind of thing. But, uh, and when they seek it out, they want that, you know, they want the, the real deal. They want the gold standard. They want the, the characters that have been established and, and, you know, have this depth and, in history and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, I, I don't see that 5G will succeed beyond perhaps just the, the initial burst. And uh, they're going, and, and I don't think they ever have the, they don't, I don't think they have the, the ambition to replace those characters entirely. Uh, if anything, maybe just spawn off, you know, their own, you know, their own universe with them and see how that goes. But like uh, the ultimate universe at Marvel. Absolutely. Which, you know, we saw what happened with that eventually, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, those things eventually do run their course because they don't have deep roots and, uh, you know, something, you know, something happens that that sort of, you know, fouls the works up. But uh, but uh, I just don't know if, you know, I don't know if it's going to have legs beyond just like the, the first the first initial launch. All right, then we have. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat, Josh. Very yeah, much appreciate, uh, appreciate it, any support for the channel. Uh, the next comment is from Dave Scarpa. You have to admit the Joe Hill uh, comic line has been great. Hill House Comics on Black Label. I think most of it is really good. Uh, I'm not really liking Lolo Woods, uh, but the the Dollhouse family is really interesting. <laughs> um, I think Basketful of Heads has been been interesting as well. So it's very promising. I think it's one of the good things that's come out of DC Black Label. Um, what are what are your uh, customers saying about Black Label as far as Hill House Comics, Pele? They uh, they love Black Label, uh, but it's a it's a it's a it's a niche. It's it's definitely a niche. And uh, first, you've got to have the people that are willing to shell out the additional money because Black Label is kind of a premium line. And then you've got the uh, you've got the you know customers that are that are willing to try something new, you know within within DC or Marvel's framework. Most of the people that want something new, they just want get away completely from Marvel and DC altogether, and they go to independence. So, but the the people that are are very dedicated. Uh, they they really like the content that's being published, and uh, you know they uh, they're they're there week in week out to buy whatever the black label book of the week is of the month. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it sells. We'll see how it goes from there and whether it has legs. It seems like Joe Hill comics are like the spiritual successor to vertigo. Like it's what vertigo mm -hmm. should have been when they brought it back. I'm right. certain that they were supposed to be part of vertigo before. Yeah. Played. But instead of just trying to be like, Hey, look, we have copycat Sandman books and we have these weirdo, you know, goddess mode books. Like, and doing all that weird stuff like Border Town, like Vertigo was always a horror line, 
And yeah, the, you know, you can bring back a Sandman book. That's fine. But the Joe Hill books, I think, you know, Vertigo was always doing new things. They were always pushing the envelope. Right. And, and Joe Hill was kind of like the next thing. It's like what Vertigo was all about. It's like, we got fresh new ideas. We're going to bring them to the table. And I think fans are resonating to it. I think that's why it's a success because it's, it's well done. Everyone seems to be happy with it. And this is what they, a good editor at Vertigo would have done instead of letting it fall apart. Now there is no Vertigo and we got Joe Hill comics and it's just weird. But I'm glad it's working out. And for people that want those books, they're happy. Yeah, one I keep going. Uh, this one series, of course, that I talk about all the time on the channel is is The Last God. And that is tremendously popular in my shop. Uh, not every shop, but my shop, it's it's tremendously popular, uh, has a really strong, you know, readership base. And, uh, and it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. It's like reading, you know, a Lord of the Rings or something like that. You know, the, this, this really great texture and uh, quality of art and story is is just the best of the genre right now as far as as far as fantasy comics are concerned. Absolutely echo that. So I guess FF2 was looking more specifically for Spider-Man or X-Men one shots for Spider-Man. We already talked about it. I'm going to give it back to you. Spectacular Spider-Man Peter or Peter Parker, Spectacular Spider-Man 310. Chip Zdarsky is the writer and the artist on that one. It's about as good as a one shot Spider-Man in recent memory could ever be. Breen, can you give us a one shot X-Men book people should pick up? Whew, when was the last time anybody did a one shot? Well, there was a uh, one shot <laughs> what if X-Men from Brian Hill. That was okay. yeah, so I I completely I completely escaped my notice. Um I'm probably the wrong person to ask for this. All right, you, know, you said I'm thinking, you know, my mind goes to God loves man kills, and that's only what 35 years ago now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I can well, I can suggest uh the annuals during the Claremont era. Uh, mm -hmm. not only were they Claremont stories and one shots, which is really rare because Claremont was all about the epic saga. You rarely got one shots. He did do them a few in there, but the annuals he, that were one shot stories and during the certain time, the, a certain year span, every single one was Art Adams art. And getting Art Adams interior art is something special. I would seek those out. Like, I think off the top of my head, I think they're like issues 9, 10, and 11, maybe. Yeah, you're you're um, right. Um, d there we go, right there. And they're probably cheap because annuals never go up. <laughs> Let's, uh, you know. well, there's a couple of exceptions as far as value, but yeah, they're, they're yeah, still rarely. really reasonable. You know, they're still really, really reasonable. Oh, I, always, right. I always okay. like uh, the new X-Men annual 2001, the, the sideways one that, uh, that. that Grant Morrison did. <clears throat> and it was Grant Morrison and Lionel Francis U. I thought that was really good. Um, and then I'm trying to remember what the hell was the one that came out uh, about a year ago, right before the X, the Uncanny X Men relaunch. Uh, Brian Hill one? No, 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 no. It was the one that was. Um, oh, it had. Uh, was it not? Did it have Dave Finch interiors? It was a one shot. I'm blanking on it. I'll, I'll remember it eventually. <laughs> All right, FF2's on fire. He says, which writer do you want to be put on Avengers? I think I wanted to see Scott Snyder leave DC, go to Marvel, write Avengers, and also do an Iron Man series. That's, that would have been perfect. Uh, Breen, who do you want to see on Avengers? Of the people currently working in comics, God, that's a tough one. And, and whoever it is, is they're, they probably are working at DC right now. <laughs> um, I'd like to see you know, Venditti, possibly. Oh, uh, not a bad choice. Um, yeah, I said Snyder would have been a good choice. I, yeah, although a guy that loves to write metal, putting him on Iron Man, that might just make his head explode. Um, <laughs> I think it would be beautiful yeah. uh, if you get Capullo. Oh, you know, Capullo, yeah, Snyder on Avengers. Yeah. Marvel might actually sell 100,000 copies again. Yeah, yeah I think go. that uh, could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine Capullo's artwork in Avengers for like a wow. twenty issue run? You know, the, you know the the impact would create a crater that would go all the way to China. You know, it'd be pretty amazing. 
Yeah, it's. You know who I'd like to see? Scott Lobdell. Oh. oh. He could write Avengers. He can yeah. he can do just good, simple, long form superhero comics. Yep. Now the second part of that question would be what type of Avengers are we talking about? Yeah, the old school where you know you actually had to earn your way on the team or before they became like you know a, 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 the end of an Oprah episode where you get to be an Avenger, you get to be an Avenger. <laughs> I mean, I, I, who cares? Yeah, you know, I said so. If it's old school Avengers, I'd love to see. Yeah, you know, like I said, Venditti. Yeah, you know. and I think I think Lobdell is better suited on team books. I think he really struggles. You could see that would happen with um, Red Hood when they got rid of the outlaws, and it was just like, oh god, you know. But when he was doing the outlaws, he was really making something interesting with the Artemis and Bizarro, and and he did something really that had a nice dynamic between the characters. He he had that with X Men when he tried to cop, you know, not copy, but tried to fill in the shoes for Claremont. He had to try to really do that because that was the hallmark of X Men, right? It was a character soap opera. Uh, I think Avengers would be interesting. I, he's not the greatest writer. You're not going to go out there and be like, oh my god, Scott Lobdell. But he's solid, right? And mm-hmm. you know that's that's what you kind of want sometimes with an ongoing series. Is you if you were to read an eighty issue run, eighty or eighty five issues like Tom King, you know you want solid. Just I can bank on it being a decent book month after month. You know, to all point, I know is I don't want Jason Aaron on it. His uh, Avengers became must not read material in a matter of a few months. Yeah, Heavy Smoke has got the next question. This is an Ash question. Uh, favorite DC Rebirth run uh, before Bendis and Didier ruined everything. His were Superman and uh, Super Sons. Mine, of course, is Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. Ash, I know you love Rebirth. What's your favorite series? Superman by Tomasi uh, and uh, our boy that ended up leaving, Patrick Gleason. Um, he, he made me... I always liked Superman, but I never felt he worked for me in an ongoing title. Like I, I enjoyed good Superman stories here and there but the ongoing just month after month of superman doing stuff i I, for me it never worked i never understood it i didn't get it it's probably my fault but tomasi made me get it and then he brought a new dynamic as well to the table that to me is my favorite version of superman now and i just i miss it so much and it was fun and it was endearing and it was hopeful and um yeah that that's my favorite all right. And Ryan Wilson saying Days of Future Past is only two issues long. That's kind of close to a one shot. Yeah. Sergeant Bats says old comics are toxic. Oh, bats. Come on, man. Oh, Lord Bats. <laughs> well, well, I mean, some of the ink may be a They're little probably bit toxic, toxic to Dan Didio and CB Sabolsky because it makes their whole copyright <laughs> writers look like. Food. I would not lick the. Do not lick your comics. Yes, no, I, I, I would. I wouldn't lick toxic. them. I mean, wash your hands after you, after after you read them. Some of the ink, you know, there's probably oh. some lead in some comics. <laughs> wow. That says they're sexist really cool. and racist. Does he have a point? No. On the top of his head. <laughs> <laughs> all right he's gonna get something right bat says he wants dan didio at marvel i would love this personally because i am a dc reader first and foremost would 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 it would dan didio be worse than uh Cebulski? yes i think he would i yes. think Cebulski oh is just gosh, there to do interviews and eat uh chicken wings i think dan didio mm-hmm. is is doing absolute damage with his ideas yeah. this being sunday i will say that may god bless and keep didio far away from comics <clears throat> that's that's all i have to may say. he win the lottery and go off and retire happy oh well we got we got tim lim in the house didn't realize sorry i'm trying to scroll through uh kamustapo uh thank you very much for joining us live from the Bunderdome. the uh, donald thump himself uh, i believe he just announced his was it the Magalorian coming out? The third and final uh, part of the Walmite series going to be great. Thank you very much for showing up, uh, Tim. I did not get that copy of Black Ops from from Doug. He forgot to bring it, and Uh-oh. I don't have the heart to bring it up to him because I don't want to be rude. Oh, by the <laughs> way, I just remembered the easily the best X Men one shot. 
giant sized X Men number one. Yeah, pick that up mm-hmm. at your local comic book store, kids. Yes, yeah, cheap facsimile. That's a good facsimile. <laughs> no, you can buy the facsimile for five bucks. Oh, uh, five well, bucks. can you? We're selling them for about fifteen now. Uh, my um, local shop still has them on the shelf. Good, get them, get them, because I, I ran out, <laughs> and now they cost a lot. All right, this is a dot question: Which writer should be writing Captain America and Winter Soldier? I would like to see Ed Brubaker, but he does he doesn't want to write capes anymore. Who do you think would be good? Um, since it's not going to be Brew Baker, you know who I'd actually kind of like to see? I, I I'd be really curious to see what uh Chris Gage does. Oh yeah. Or I mean, especially with his with his background of being, you know, a uh you know, he he got really got his start for writing for Law and Order, so mm-hmm. that would be, you know, that would be interesting. I'd also, you know, what we we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but I'm coming back to it, and I'm thinking it's not the worst idea in history. Garth Ennis, mm, Garth Ennis, because so. no, like just him. Unless you want the like, Captain America torturing people, maybe skinning some people alive. Uh, no, no, him like uh, him more like with the the kind of like the spy and war story stuff. <clears throat> I I think I think that'd be interesting. But he need to find like some way soldier. to undermine. He 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 doesn't respect superheroes. No, he doesn't. But. Sometimes when, you, sometimes when you pull people out of their comfort zone, they come up with some really great stuff. Yeah. I would love to see, you know, my, I would, I would, after reading Daredevil. Sometimes when you put up people outside their comfort zone, they write Brian Michael Bendis's Man of Steel followed up with Action Comics and Superman. You are Every, correct. Brian Michael Bendis doesn't have a comfort zone. <laughs> um, I, w- I, w- I would really, I know this is kind of cliche for me to say at Mar- Marvel all the time because I do think he's the best writer, but actually, truthfully, reading Daredevil, I think Zadar, I would love to see what Zadarsky did with a similar style on a Captain America book. But to have a different answer, I honestly <laughs> I would I would kill to see Robert Venditti do Captain America. I want Peter David or Patrick Gleason. Peter Larry Hama. Yeah, yeah I don't think yeah, Peter David's never written Captain America has ever any length of time. Put would, the man on want a that. regular ongoing series. He's writing this oh. awesome symbiote Spider-Man that nobody even you, really yeah. even knows that exists. You, you know, Doc mentioned Chris Gage, and what what does Marvel have him doing? Gwen Stacy, like slots. Yeah, Coffee Boy. I don't get Gwen it. Gwen Stacy. What? Gwen uh, Stacy. Yeah, and he's writing. He's co-writing Twenty Twenty. What a what a waste! I mean, because he's a tremendous writer. I mean, yeah, you know, didn't he do the Ninja or Ninja K or whatever a couple years ago? Last, yeah. last great Valiant comic series he wrote. I, mean, I, I you know I thought Matt Kent's was a little better, but Gage's was really good too. And yeah, you know, actually, his Avengers Academy was a very good series mm-hmm. about seven or eight years ago, or however long that was. Is it the tail yeah, end still, of anything Marvel? You know, it's it's definitely it's definitely a a, a run that. Um, that people come in looking for, you know, it's just kind of like, do you have said, yeah. And then I kind of point them over in that direction yeah, more, more often than you'd think. So, so why can't he get, you know, a decent book? He's also the, one of the key contributors to the daredevil series at Netflix when it was still good. Mm-hmm. There you go. Mm-hmm. All right. This is a West question. This is a question for the D man. How would you bring back Dick Grayson's nightwing? This is so easy. But West uh, loves the D. What's up? Yeah. West loves the D. <laughs> West, <laughs> West, West loves the D. <laughs> it's not West loves the D, man. It's just the D, man, baby. <laughs> All right. How would I bring back Dick Grayson's Nightwing? Ben Percy did DC Comics and everyone else a great favor because in his last story arc called, um, what is it? The one where the worm shows up when it's there. Uh, they basically downloaded dick grayson's fully functional brain all of his memories everything his personality into a little chip and no one ever recovered it babs was supposedly on the case so you just have to find that and re-upload it into rick grayson then he comes back to being dick grayson again and it's easy peasy because ben percy had it all set up to fix tom king's uh, batman 55 fiasco that ruined the character he had already was planting seeds on how he was going to bring him back 
and it's it's right there waiting to be used. Anybody else have a better idea? No better idea. That sounds oh. perfect to me. Um, yeah. Unless you're going to pull a new heart, which I never <laughs> recommend. Yeah. Well, I did hear that he's starting to get his memories back in this latest issue. Yes, they are planting the seeds for That's Dick Grayson's right. return. All right. Thank God. Absolutely. This is a... Yeah, this is a pretty late question. William Medina, what's up with DC's 80th anniversary books of Joker, Robin, and Catwoman? Why $10? Oh, because they can. Uh, it's it's basically that's 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 what it comes down to because they can, you know. Uh, uh, DC thinks uh, an 80th anniversary issue is lube, and you'll take it easier. Yeah, because, because Marvel Comics 1000 actually sold. Yeah, it did. It did sell, and uh, and now DC is like, hey, damn, damn we'll incoming. Action. In, even incoming sold and not at my shop but both places and people just stop buying this crap you know i know you want you know if you don't like the prices and stuff like that speak with your wallet uh i know that's hard and uh you know I'm, i fall guilt i fall prey to that too because especially with variant covers you know a favorite artist of mine will come with a character with a cover and i just go goo goo gaga over it but uh you know the the best way to stop that is you know, to, to stop buying the $10 books. And I know that hurts, but you know, the good news is, is if you don't buy it now within, you know, five or six months, you'll be able to find it in the discount bin for, you know, half price. Yep. So and as it happens invariably every single time. So I skipped all of them. Yeah. All of them. So, <laughs> if, you, know, you know, $10 for the detective comics, 1000. I, 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 I actually was really happy to give 10 bucks for that book, but a Joker, was, a Robin and a yeah. Catwoman, What? You, well, you some, of them, some of them are great deals. Uh, uh action 1000. I thought eh, uh, $8, eh. 799. Yeah. That was for a hundred page so, book. Yeah. You know, it's a like, thousandth like, issue. Like, yeah, yeah. As a yeah. Fan, it was a, it was a true there, landmark. But as a yeah. fan, you're like, I want to own this. Like, it's the thousandth issue of a comic I love. Even if the even if the inside is meh, you're like, it's still. I was happy to like get stuff like that. But but Joker doesn't have a book. Robin doesn't have a book. Catwoman, I guess, does now. But like, it, you're gonna play off. You know, like Flash and Wonder Woman both are issue seven fifty. It's a it's a you know they're playing off a milestone. These other characters, yeah, they're fake just milestones. They're just yeah, it's a fake milestone. Yeah, and that's yeah they're squeezing the tit. So you know it's you know when the milk runs out, you know they'll they'll have to go back to actually you know putting content at a reasonable price. But uh, the problem is, is there's such an appetite for comics, and this is one thing I want to touch on was the appetite from comics, good comics, you know, and people will pay and, and the, people will pay that $10 even more for, for 60 to 80 pages of, of goodness, you know, and you know, it's it, people have kind of painted themselves into that corner because they would pay it. And, uh, you know, and these companies see that and, Unfortunately, I don't think that comics are really going to get any cheaper. The best thing that we can hope for is the content gets better. So, you know, I, I I'd love to see I'd love to see them become reasonable and to 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 not uh, become predators, you know, towards the comic base. But hey, here's some perspective. Debbie Downer, man. Well, here's a little perspective. Real Reality quick, sucks. Yeah, sometimes. the Joker book is going to be ten bucks. For the price of six copies of that, I got the Joker hardcover thousand page omnibus. I know. I mean that's that's you know, and, and if I'd paid full price for the price of ten copies of that Joker, I mean that's insane. Mm hmm Oh yeah, I know. I know. It's it's not and like I said, you know, it's 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 one of those situations that if you don't like the price, step back, you know, and what gets initially sold to the stores is what the companies look at, not what you know you go back and buy later on. So, so we need to we need to paraphrase Kelly Sue DeConnick now. If you don't like my prices, don't buy my books. Right. Yeah, just step back, 
and say, okay, I'm going to go back because there's going to be a lot of back issues. It's going to be, it's going to be in the back of issue bins. And like I said, the bargain bins, you know, you're going to be able to get it cheaper within, you know, five, within three or four months and just wait, just wait. And uh, that initial rush, once that's done, if they, if stores are ordering less copies, then, you know, they're going to get the hint, but as long as stores are ordering those copies and they buy in their they're ordering a hundred thousand copies of a, of a 10, you know, a $10 book, you know, what's going to stop them. All right. Time to get back to some old cool, cool comics. I think we're all going to yep. take this. Please be somewhat brief on this one. Cause we're wrapping things up. I want to get a couple more questions. Uh, old school DC and Marvel talked about, is there anything outside the big two that is legit old school, great comic, great or comic greatness. I love old school Valiant, specifically Exo Man of War and some of those Bloodshot and uh, Ninja, uh, Rise stuff. Breen, what's legitimately great that wasn't big two? First comics, Badger, Sable, Nexus. <laughs> Boom, did you just drop the mic? No, but you said be brief. <laughs> 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 all right, Doc, what do you say about that? Okay, I don't disagree with Breen at all. But what I would suggest would be the Ellis era of Wildstorm, uh, Stormwatch, then the Authority, and Planetary. You can also go into like stuff like Stormwatch, P, uh, Team Achilles, and, and some of the other offshoot stuff. But the, the Ellis, Stormwatch, and the Authority, and then Planetary was amazing. Wildcats version, Volume 2 and Version 3.0. And outside of Wildstorm, I'd have to say a lot of the uh, uh, you, what you about what? battleships. I thought you liked that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'll I think I'll pass on that. But you know what? The um, vo vo the the first ongoing Cyber Force series from the mid nineties, especially after the Claremont did two issues and it kind of became a very kind of spiritual successor to X-Men. Um, especially now, after what's the Joe Mad series that you're always pushing. Not oh Battle God, Battle Chasers. There you go. My bad. Yeah, Battle Chasers. Battle <clears throat> Chasers and uh J. Scott Campbell's Danger Girl. Boom. Ash, what do you recommend as old school greatness that wasn't big big two? Besides uh, you saw you, Jimbo, because we know you love Stan Sakai. All right, so I won't. I, that it counts. I'm not going to restate it. I also want to give second what you said, Wes, about the Valiant, specifically the second run of Valiant when they came back in 2012. That Robert mm -hmm. Venditti XO, uh, that Bloodshot run, Ninja K, just fantastic yeah. you guys do not Premier, Matt clay man art and an indie book just jesus you guys it's phenomenal you won't believe how good comics could be like why is marvel and dc not doing this it's amazing but since wes already said that i'm gonna say something different is go back to the 90s dark horse run when they made those deals with frank miller and john byrne and uh, mike mignola and they did that i think it was called the maverick line or was it icon i forget but it was like an indie line trying to compete with Image with Creator Owned when Creator Owned was like a new thing. And Frank Miller was doing his Sin City books, which despite what you think about modern Miller, Sin City was moi. Uh, John Byrne was doing Next Men, which was basically an X-Men. It's like he's like, well, I can't do X-Men, so I'm going to do Next Men. So if you like X-Men, check that out. And then, of course, Mike, everyone knows Hellboy. So there's comic greatness right there in those Dark Horse books. Uh, that's what I would check out. All right, Paley, what are you saying? Okay, Hellboy especially. Uh, but I want to go even further back. The the granddaddy of indie comics, as far as, you know, the, the big splash in the scene, Cerebus the Aardvark. Uh, go back to, you know, it, the, first, the first part of the series is kind of hokey and a little weird. It's still great, but it's a little hokey and weird. But then you get into high society and church and state, and it will blow your freaking head off. This is some really amazing writing uh you know it's just there's there's no there's no way to put it. dave sim was in top form uh will go down in history as one of the greatest comic runs of all times probably already is considered that by by uh by a lot of people in the industry fantastic uh the political satire real real political satire real religious satire uh done in a uh an absolutely brilliant way uh 
fantastic stuff. Go and get it. The omnibuses, you can still find those. Um, if you want to go back and get the back issues, you know, they're getting kind of pricey down in the single digits, but uh, they always have been. But, uh, but yeah, go for Cerebus the Aardvark. Fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful series. Surprised no one's recommending Saga, but that's another uh, subject. Uh, Josh is saying <laughs> there's a rumor that Grayson's going to propose to Barbara in an upcoming issue. You think that can involve the chip? I sure hope so. I don't understand why he would be proposing to Barbara since he's been so rude and mean to her and he's off gallivanting with some other woman. But if that's what it takes to bring Dick Grayson back, that's what we need because, uh, oh, my goodness, Rick Grayson is an absolute train wreck disaster. And it, Dan Jurgens couldn't even sell it or fix it. And uh, Black Cat was right. That was the bleeding edge was the, was the story arc that I forgot earlier. Thank you very much because I blanked. Uh, who's writing Nightwing now? Dan Jurgens just talked about that. Okay, we got any? We got any more good questions? Mm, uh, uh, this is this is this is a doc question. Uh, any opinion on Wildstorm being integrated into the DC universe uh, during the New Fifty Two? And were there any good titles from Wildstorm in the New Fifty Two? Uh, integrating into the DCU was a terrible idea. And uh, the only good title that came out of that was Midnighter and then the Midnighter and Apollo series. That was it. Everything else was terrible. Everything else that they took from it was terrible. The best that DC ever did with, you know, crossover or anything with Wildstorm um, when it was actually in their own universe was when Majestic took over for Superman for like four issues. Because they got swapped, but that that was it. Everything else was terrible. Yeah. Oh, uh, somebody uh, else pointed up Miracle Man. Absolutely, that's Miracle Man's fantastic series. Oh, uh, first seven issues are as good as comics uh, have ever been. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. I've yeah, never thought of that. I, I I would have seen that in the chat, but I threw my phone across the room an hour and a half ago, so I didn't say I missed it. Um, <laughs> well, you were embarrassing the channel, so I'm glad that you did that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been embarrassing the channel for an hour and a half. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I'm used to it now. now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just afraid we're going to get whacked now that Breen is embarrassed. Uh, I, I yes. embarrass the channel every day. <laughs> Absolutely. So it so looks like we yeah. got to basically all the questions. I, I skipped a few here and there because the, there was redundancy and some other things. But like I said, the, the reactions to Leah Williams, V.I.L.'s new X-Men series will be up tomorrow. Doc and I just talked about it. We also talked about the Rob Liefeld. Uh, some car uh, creators aren't getting paid at Marvel. Um, uh, do we have any? We talked about 5G. What's up? Yeah, and some conspiracy theories on that. <laughs> And then Ryan Wilson is saying you can get DC and Marvel trades from three to six dollars at Ollie's and some card covers uh, and omnibuses for up to seven bucks. Great point. Definitely get some good prices, but you will not get the great customer service that you will receive from great people like Paley and your other local comic shop owners. Hey, Amen. We love you. We love you. Come come see us. <laughs> so I think that'll basically wrap everything up. Does anyone have something that they really wanted to talk to talk about that, that I didn't get to. Um, no, not really. Mm -mm. Boom. I can't believe I, I covered it all people. Now it's time for the comic book recommendations. Green. I know you're, you're reading all the new stuff. What, what comic books are you recommending? <laughs> uh, uh, come back to me. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doc, what are you reading? All right, this week was uh, the only thing that I really enjoyed this week was uh, Flash Forward. But I do love the fact that I get two Brett Booth books every time that they come out. I just wish they'd come out, you know, on opposite weeks. But uh, Flash Forward is the one thing that's actually fixing uh, Wally West from the disaster that you know tom king made him into in heroes in crisis um but bloodshot is still good if you just make up your own dialogue uh <laughs> ignore the dialogue in the book it's the the art's great the the dialogue's terrible 
and you can make a great story out of it in your head. Um, X Force, um, and buy rags. Absolutely. So this is a topic that comes up, you know, every few weeks. Pele, people want to know uh, what your store is, and do you have an online store? Do not have an online store. We're local shop only. Um, the uh, my store is located in the Knoxville area. Um, I would I would dearly love to be able to to advertise it, but due to the threats and uh, violence and whatnot that have been directed towards me for my online persona, I just don't think that would be a good idea because uh, yeah, there's a lot of crazy people out there on the internet's interwebs. So. Yes. And there have been people that have been looking for you. <laughs> yes, they have looked. They, they've. There have been people that have called every single shop in the Knoxville area asking for Pele, and uh, and that type of determination is either somebody that really, really, really wants to shop with us, or they have bad intentions. And I can't think that all those people have just just love me. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. If you're asking, you know, what's Pele's store? It's in Tennessee. He does want to give the details because there are crazy people out there, and I feel bad because he should be able to promote the store on the channel. I think a lot mm -hmm. of people love you, and if they were in the area, they would definitely go to your store and want to give you some money because you give us a lot of great information and all that good stuff. But All the comic shops in the greater Knoxville area are fantastic. Uh, you know, if you live in this area, you know, just, just you know, any of those will be able to suit your needs. Uh, I know them all, and it, it, I'd say the vast majority of them are, are very dedicated, decent, you know, hardworking people. All right. So in the chats, Ryan Wilson and Dane Barrett, my personal favorite commenter. He's a great guy. He's always in the, in the chats. He's always razzing me, giving me crap. I like that kind of gusto. They're recommending Dead Eyes. Uh, FF2 is recommending Family Tree by Jeff Lemire, Undiscovered Country by Scott Snyder and uh, Charles Sewell, and Batman, which is James Tinian. Next issue comes out next week. Pele, what do you recommend at the store this week? Uh, Teen Titans number 38. Uh, ongoing Teen Titans series has been fantastic. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed reading it. Uh, I'm going to make a back issue recommendation. Uh, not really a back issue recommendation, but a, a facsimile edition. Uh, the Incredible Hulk number 180 came out, uh, facsimile edition. And if you great read, uh, it's a good opportunity to get a book that's spiraling out of every, you know almost everybody's reach and value. So I would recommend picking that up. Uh, you could probably still track down 181. You may pay a little bit of a premium for that now. Down the road, those are going to be extremely valuable. Uh, due to the due to the scarcity of the originals uh also sarah like i talked before cerebus get the omnibuses uh you can find them inexpensively in most places uh that's a fantastic series that that needs more recognition than it receives and i think you will be greatly you will be greatly rewarded with a fantastic allegory mm -hmm. all right tevi is saying he dropped teen titans a long time ago Man, you read the whole run of X Men Red. How are you talking about Teen Titans? Exactly. <laughs> <I know. laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> it poisoned his mind. Oh, oh God. Oh, my. I How love you, Teddy, but, but come on. <laughs> come on. I know. He reads Tom Taylor, but, uh, but it, it drops. Makes no sense. Although supposedly deceased is good. I still haven't read it, but I need to read it before Unkillable it goes is. up. Green. You, it, the spotlight's back on you. Are you uh, ready now? What do you recommend? And it doesn't have to be new comics. That was a joke. No, uh, no, no. But I, I'm going to recommend two from the last couple weeks, and you know, a, a lot in part due to Ash's you know videos and recommendations. And um, Batman Superman Five uh, lights terrible, and the first issue of Donny Cates' Thor. Excellent comic go. book. It was uh, Ash's was, videos. Uh, I thought he did documentaries. <laughs> well, no, no, no. He's he's making the transition from documentary filmmaker to quick strike. <laughs> he's like an MMA guy now. Oh, he's transitioning. Yes. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> All right, Ash. Uh, we're we're teasing. We everyone knows you're the Joe Rogan of comic book YouTube. What are you recommending this week? This week's coming up uh, on my pull list. Uh, I have only four comics coming out this week, and they're all Batman. DC is having a lot of problems. People are upset, but 
I weirdly enough, Batman is the ship has been righted. You got r- actual Batman, Tinian's writing it. You got uh, Detective Comics of Tomasi. You got Batman Superman coming out this week. It's got uh, one of the most underrated writers in comics with Joshua Williamson. And then you've got one of my favorite comics, period, in Batman Curse of the White Knight with uh, Sean Gordon Murphy. It's a Batman fiesta this week. That's what I recommend is get back on the horse if you if you fell off because of other reasons. Batman's good right now. All right. I am answering Sebby's question week. right now. And sweet. There we go. All right, so this has been a, a decidedly bad week for comics. There's nothing really great out there. Freedom Fighters yeah. number 12 is the, the finale of Robert Venditti's excellent t- uh, take on the characters. It's a wonderful story. It's going to read fabulous as a, as a trade, uh, uh, which should be the second uh, part of it coming out soon. Uh, Spawn 304, I believe it is. I think it's 304. was actually pretty damn good. It's probably the best comic I've read this week. But I was on vacation. I haven't read everything. Be on the lookout for the new Guardians of the Galaxy next uh, week from um, Al Ewing. It's it's the the post Donny Cates take. A lot of people like Al Ewing's take on Marvel cosmic stuff, so it might be their comic book for you. And also Wonder Woman 750, I think, is going to be a disaster. Make sure you're looking for the review right here on the channel. Um, Oh, wait. We got another. We got... Old, old school comics. Probably should have had him on the channel. What was I thinking about? Uh, for old comics, reread Dave Cockrum's Futurins. I was going to sell my copies, but then I read reread them. We talked about Byers Morrissey earlier, and I think that you were going to be happy that you kept that. Can you read Freedom Fighters without knowing anything about it beforehand? Absolutely. Yes. First issue basically drops the old Freedom Fighters and, and sets you to the new ones. And I think, if I haven't talked fast enough... That should do today's uh, be the end of today's show. Thank you all so much for joining me. Had a great panel talking about old school comics, taking all the re- uh, viewer questions. Got a lot more viewer questions than I actually anticipated. I like it. It was yeah, fun. This, this was a good format. I'll enjoy this. Dane Barrett. We recommended Batman 87, Curse of White Knight 6, and Marauders. Coming in late, as always. Thank you very much, Dane. <laughs> he might be the only guy older than Breen that, that comments in my videos. So I'm not going to give him too much guff. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, he doesn't have that much time left. Oh. Maybe. Who knows? These, these guys I like, we're all timers here. I like Dane. He's one of the only people, along with Breen, that actually watch my videos. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not true. I watch your nah, videos. I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's like fine uh, wine. Comic comic collectors don't get old. We just get better. <laughs> and we'll Ryan Wilson saying, make sure to let us know next time you plan on doing these live videos. We do a live session every Saturday. We've never really done a, a viewer's choice and question and answer, but I do think it was fun. Maybe we'll, we'll have to do this maybe once a month or something. This is actually yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd be yeah, down to do this. Absolutely. Once a month. If we can do them on down Sundays, yo, I'm in. Yeah, like a Sunday morning uh old school comics and chill yeah maybe every maybe the first sunday of every month will be old school comics and chill we'll see but uh, i like the panel i would want to keep this group i think the feels right i want the old guys in here so we can talk about old comics and it was a lot of fun thank you all for joining us and hopefully you smash the like button and if you weren't subscribed you subscribe to the channel and uh we'll see y'all later so all right y'all love y'all take